In the name of the Father, Father Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, Creator, bless, and in our hearts set up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made, to fill the hearts which thou hast made. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is Peter Helen with Citizens for Community Media. And with the uh, defeat of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court, uh, it's a great time to have Mike Jones on, okay? Because a lot of people know Mike came here in 1979. He was a professor at St. Mary's. And one of the reasons, or maybe the primary reason, that uh, he got into conflict with St. Mary's, which led to his dismissal, was over the abortion issue. And you've been front and center on this, and that, that's kind of how I met you. you know, I remember Gary Spaulding and uh, the intensity of, to some of the things we were involved in. Okay? Gary Spaulding was a missionary to Russia. He was like going to be martyred kind of guy. You know, you had uh, Brother Andrew and God Smuggler, you know, smuggling Bibles into Russia, and the whole thing was, how did we convert Russia? Well, <laughs> his wife didn't want to pursue it any longer. He comes back, and boom, he gets into the, the pro-life movement. So boom, we're right with Operation Rescue, okay, with the Brattons and Father Westland, you know, the Lambs of Christ. So this thing started get, you know, intense, and uh, you felt the intensity of that, obviously. And now it's been 50 years, which is unique because you have this notion of seven times seven, the Jubilee. Not that it means anything, but it's just been 50 years. Shorter, it's 49 years actually. Okay. 49 years, 73 uh, was the date. So in January of this coming year, that will be 50 years. So it's 49 years, so that's probably more biblical than 50 because it's seven times seven. Okay. But either way, it's been a long haul. And uh, you're right, I got involved in it uh, when I arrived here at uh, St. Mary's College. Um, and felt that uh, it was a Catholic college uh, where, and that I had uh, the freedom to express my views. And so I wrote op-ed pieces in the uh, South Bend Tribune about abortion. And so after a year, I'm thinking I'm in a tenure track contract. That's the reason, the only reason I came out here, that I had six years to prove myself. At the end of the first year, the department, char uh, department chairman, Liz Noel, came in and said that, uh, uh, I was coming up for a review, and she said that uh, the people in the department are upset about your stand on abortion. This is what she said to me a week before the review. And I thought, what's this got to do with any review of my competence as an English teacher? You know, at this point, I had course evaluations in my drawer. Uh, and I uh, thought, well, maybe that should be the, I thought that was going to be the basis. But anyway, I said, well, you know, okay, they're upset, uh, but uh, I have academic freedom and this is a Catholic college. Well, it turns out I was wrong on both counts. It, I didn't have academic freedom and it wasn't a Catholic college. It was a feminist college. The feminists had taken over St. Mary's during this period of time and they had imposed their views uh, on everyone there. And uh, if you didn't go along with them, uh, you were fired. And that's what I, happened to me, I was fired. And that would have been uh, the fall of 1980, which is when I got the notice that I was fired. So that, you know, uh, woke me up to a reality that was kind of peripheral before that point. There was a time, I, I'm, I've been thinking about this era, about what happened here. And I, I came to the conclusion that I, I was, I got on the last train out of Paris. Do you remember uh, Casablanca? There's the last train out of Paris. The Nazis are heading toward, and you had to get on the train, or it was you were going to be in trouble. And I think the last train out of Paris took place in somewhere between 1967 and 1969, which is when the Cultural Revolution took on, uh, uh, took off, let's say. And uh, a part of that was certainly Roe versus Wade. I mean, uh, and when you're, when you're talking about Supreme Court decisions, you're always talking about some ratification of something after the fact. 
there's always something that starts, a movement that starts, and eventually it percolates up to the Supreme Court. And at that point, it's either yay or nay, whether it becomes the law of the land. So we're talking about 1967, the summer of love, uh, the beginning of the hippie movement in San Francisco, and this vibration is going out all across the nation. There's a strange vibration. They even made a song about it. Well, I picked up that strange vibration, and I had the sense that something was changing at that point. But, but, but was it changing partly because the media is telling you it's changing? Of course it is. I'm, I'm sensitive. It, wasn't, it was certainly the media, and I'm talking about primarily Time uh, Magazine and Life Magazine. And one of the things that Life Magazine did at this point, I remember reading it at the time, was they did an article on this weird drug called LSD. I had no idea what this was. But the, the people in the summer of love were taking this drug, and that was the future and something like that. So we were being set up for something uh, that involved drugs, certainly involved drugs. And nobody knew about drugs then. All you knew about was alcohol at no, that time. I mean, that was the big issue. Are, you, are we, you know, go down the shore, and you go to a bar, and you're underage, and, and you hope you don't get arrested because you're 20 years old and you're one year under. This was the state of the art angst for my generation at that yeah, point. But drugs was something you did in private. Drinking was a social event. It was social. It's a, drug, <laughs> first of all, we didn't do drugs. No one did drugs no. in private. Just didn't, didn't do them. But this was changing. And part of it was the media. It was time life. And uh, this was part of the media uh, barrage, which I later, you know, you know it, 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 you're a guinea pig in an experiment. And the guinea pig doesn't know what's in the scientist's mind, and that's exactly the situation we were in. I thought, this is Life magazine. We get it every week. Uh, it's just telling what, it, well, no, it, it was a part, there was an attempt to uh, engage in the social engineering of the culture. And there was no parents that were warning the children. Because they didn't know. <coughs> no. Now, uh, I, I'm, uh, it, it could be that they should have known, but uh, it was secret. So we're ta what am I talking about, secret? Secret what? Well, the, it was called the MK Ultra program, and it was part of the CIA. And they were uh, the CIA had a problem with our generation. Uh, the CIA had come into existence in 1953. It was sort of there during World War II under a different name. Um, but they had a problem with our generation because our generation was against the war. And so this is a serious problem because we've got to get these guys uh, dressed up as soldiers and send them over to Vietnam and it looks as if it's not working out. So they used MK Ultra as a way of infiltrating the youth movement, which we thought was anti-war. Well, it turns out it wasn't that simple because you had bands like the Grateful Dead, which was one of those San Francisco bands that everyone was hearing about. And it turns out they had a chemist there who was distributing LSD. Uh, so were they part of MK Ultra? Well, one of the guys there was part of MK Ultra, but it turns out MK Ultra had gone to San Francisco. I don't know where they had flowers in their hair, but they had set up three safe houses in San Francisco where they were doing uh, uh, espionage on the. Uh, they were surveilling this movement and trying to figure out where they weak points were and where they could enter. And drugs were where the en the entry point. And they started spreading LSD use. Now there was another drug there called marijuana, and I think that proved. Well, yeah. in our town, when they had FM radio, <clears throat> my friends, it was a railroad town where I was born, I'd visit my friend, and his buddies were into FM radio, which was Mayo, um, uh, Clapton, you know, those various groups, and they were into it. But what came with it, which they didn't want me to know, because I was more athletics, was the drugs. Right. And they were taking the Quaaludes, started coming in, and the marijuana, and it just started. Yeah. Now, you're four years younger than me, and that's a very significant difference in the terms of this. Mm -hmm. Because the, old, the older you were, the less chance you had to get sucked in. And this was a crucial difference. I'm reviewing a memoir of a woman who went through this. She's seven years younger than me, and that was a huge. She talked about her older brothers. I would be their age. The difference, huge difference here. Oh yeah, one year was a, was a yeah. difference. So it was <clears throat> so it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it was an operation. But part of the sex operation, there were consequences to here. Uh, there's a consequence to sexual activity, and it, uh, believe it or not, it, it can be pregnancy. You can actually you can actually get pregnant from 
having sexual intercourse. I know this comes as a shock to a lot of people, but that was the main problem. According to the oligarchs, and the man who spoke for the oligarchs was Aldous Huxley, and the plan for our country was Brave New World, which was a utopian or dystopian novel about the future. But, but maybe, but just, to, just to throw in, I don't think a lot of young people understand the shift. Like my grandmother, was the famous story with her is my, my grandfather tried to kiss her like walking her home from eighth grade or something from school. And she slaps him and didn't talk to him for a couple of months. Yeah. Okay, and like my friend that I grew up with, he was in the other, he moved to the other town, but he was going like what we thought was the best girl in the whole conference. They went together for sixth grade to sophomore or junior, didn't kiss. They were with the, okay. All of a sudden, this thing is shifting so right. quick. It, it happened in 67. That's my sense. It happened in 67. I became aware of it in 67. I think everyone started to become aware of it in 67. A change, and it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it was basically a black op that was being orchestrated by the CIA to basically destroy the uh, anti-war movement. Now, but I'm saying that it happened before that. If you want the theoretician of this movement, it was Aldous Huxley. And the idea was Brave New World. And Brave New World said, uh, basically, he, he wrote an article um, gave a speech 25 years later, uh, so late 50s, and he said, um, you know, I read 1984, and I think my book is better because that's a much better way to control people than so like the terror of the gulag uh, and that type of thing because uh, what this does to you, these soft uh, instruments of control, uh, the goal is to make you docile but happy. Now, the one thing that makes you docile and happy is sex, and the other is drugs. Uh, but the problem with sex, so what's the problem with sex? Well, people get pregnant. Women get pregnant when they have sex. So that's the problem. It's, he called it uh, reproductive delinquency, which has always been an obsession of that class of people. It goes all the way back to Malthus, Darwin, those people. I'm talking about the English uh, ruling class and the WASP ruling elite in, in America, which got its ideas from them. So drugs were a better idea. But, that, so that's going on at this time. This is uh, summer love, 67 is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But let's go back to uh, abortion. We're talking about abortion here. Nobody uh, on a national level was talking about abortion in 1967. Contraceptives had been uh, decriminalized in 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, but we're not talking about America now. We're talking about the elite centers of America. And one is California and one is New York. New York. And what do these two groups, uh, elite centers, have Well, in we know because most people that were kind of tuned into their, their, their culture, usually like in ours, there was one or two girls that, hey, she flew to New York to get an abortion. Okay. And why was it? Why did you have to fly to New York? Because your own state totally didn't allow it. Okay, so you have two colonies, let's say outposts here of progressive culture. What's the one group that controls both New York and California? New York and Hollywood to be particular. It's the Jews. And the, the, the contraception, if you're talking about Aldous Huxley and those people, was a WASP crusade, it was the English ruling class elite crusade, the eugenics movement was the WASP elite, and that grew over this period of time, but suddenly the Jews entered the picture, and the Jews entered the picture with abortion. So they weren't in the picture directly in the beginning? No, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. So they, they end and up... You're, you're, beginning, you're beginning to see the rise of Jewish influence in our culture at this point. And the man who was the head of the curve at this point was a Jew by the name of Bernard Nathanson, mm -hmm. famous Jew who was the leader. He and a guy named Lawrence Later in New York City got together on some evening uh, in Manhattan to talk about James Joyce, and they ended up talking about abortion. What's the connection? Good question. <laughs> you have to ask. They're both dead, so we can't ask them anymore. But it was like James Joyce's modernity. It's the Irish Catholic take on modernity. It was uh, cutting edge literature. Uh, uh, progressive people would get together at that time because they read books. Uh, and that's 
the, oh, but as soon as the two Jews got together in the room, they started talking about abortion, and suddenly they started to concoct a plan. And for sure, only the elites. I had, I had a friend that was like sixth grade. He moved in seventh grade, and he could read James Joyce, and we were like, you know, frozen in our seat. This guy. Yeah. Well, that's what happened. <clears throat> and, and so this could not have taken place anywhere else but in New York City because of the Jewish dominance of the culture. And the main um, accessory in this regard was the New York Times, the Jewish paper of record. And if the, so, so you got, this is 67 now, and you got that going on. 67 is when the Jews broke off uh, their connection to the Black Jewish Alliance, otherwise known as the Civil Rights Movement, because the blacks were getting uppity, and there was the Brown, uh, Ocean Hill Brownsville School Board where the blacks took over the school board and they, spelled, they expelled all the Jewish teachers. So this outraged the Jews. And at that point, they switched their allegiance to Israel rather away from the civil rights movement. That's what's going on at this time. And uh, 67 is uh, uh, also the other great event that's percolating up through the New York Times is the Holocaust. In up to that point, that wasn't. Even it wasn't a. It wasn't a, a, a. There were no Holocaust museums at this point. Okay, and it's the same group of people who's promoting all of these things, and it's the New York Times. It's the Zul Zulzburger click. The Zulzburgers own the New York Times. It's basically the Jewish paper of record, but we don't want to talk about that. We kind of hide. It was the time of uh, crypto Jewish influence. Maybe I can just. Okay, so by the time I went to Innsbruck. <coughs> 72, 71, 72, which is not far from Dachau. It wasn't that big in my head. The Holocaust was it not. It hadn't come that. So the crucial moment here is uh, the publication of a book called The Painted Bird by a, a Polish Jew by the name of Jesse Kozinski. Uh, this became a huge bestseller, and I read it when it came out. I, don't, I didn't even hear of it. Yeah, yeah, because well, because I was living in an apartment building, where everyone else in the building was a Jewish communist. Some of them were in the Vence Ramos Brigade. Some of them were Jews who weren't, you know, in the Communist Party. And one of those Jews gave me a copy of the Painted Bird by Yeshi Kaczynski. So I'm reading this thing, and it's kind of this dark story about a young boy who's all alone in Poland, although that wasn't really clear. Uh, and the Nazis come in, and what he had to put up with. And basically, it claimed, it, the, the story was that the Poles were bad people. That was an interesting aspect that I had never th thought about before. I'd seen enough Nazi movies to see the other thing. So all of these things come together at the same time. And you've got, this is the beginning of the rise of Jewish power. These are actual crucial elements that you bring these together and you have the building blocks of Jewish hegemony over your culture. And in Madison, Wisconsin, it was getting well at that building point, a this power is there. Also, <laughs> exactly at this time, uh, the Communist Party in New York City sent a bunch of young Jews. One of them is Ron Radish, mm -hmm. so he can read his memoir. It's called Commies, and he was sent to Madison, Wisconsin, to take over the university. This is all part of the hidden Jewish lore where they get together and talk to each other about this kind of stuff. Although Radish did write a book. And David uh, Horowitz it was also part of this whole operation. Okay, it's part of the Jewish takeover. That was an abortive uprising that led to the bombing of a building and blah blah blah. Uh, and the uh, uh, that wasn't really the way they took over. Okay, although they, they eventually the mat, the Solons, the lawmakers of Wisconsin, decided we're going to have to keep the Jews out, so we'll raise the price for out-of-state tuition which just made them more money, and it didn't do anything. Because they couldn't, say, address the issue, which was the Jewish issue, the, the Jewish They could address it behind the scenes, because we knew about it. Yeah, they would <clears> talk <throat> about it behind the scenes, but polite people don't say that word. Mm -hmm. As a result, the Jews took over the culture. This is so, we're talking about the, the crucial issues of the creation of the State of Israel, or the support now of the State of Israel. Well, 67 was a huge shift because of the a war. A huge shift because of the war. Uh, the beginning of the abortion movement, which was a Jewish movement from beginning to end. It wasn't like contraception. And this is exactly what Bernard Nathanson said in his memoir. 
there was crazy Jews from New York City, and if everybody knew that, it never would have passed. And the third one was the Holocaust. Okay? All of these things provided the foundation for the Jewish takeover of our culture. Now, we are in a point now uh, where I'm saying that era is coming to an end because of the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Right, which, which lends more significance to when Donald Trump came into town and we were there, you know, he spoke downtown here. That was one of the main reasons I felt compelled to support him because the potential, because we knew it was going to be two or three Supreme Court justices, the potential of putting in justices that would go after yeah. things like. So he was completely consistent uh, from the beginning with that. Uh, if we, uh, just as a reminder of what was going on at that time, uh, George Weigel, the Catholic neocon pundit from Washington, who uh, is a big supporter of the, the Jewish piano player in the Ukraine, came mm -hmm. out in National Review, the official conservative thing, and said, we have a duty not to vote for Donald Trump. Now, if everyone Catholic had followed Donald, uh, uh, George Weigel, we'd still have abortion, wouldn't we? Thanks, George. No, Thanks it, for that good advice. No, it, people att attacked you all the time. Why are you supporting Trump? The bottom line was there's going to be two or three Supreme Court justices, and I was at the Alliance for Community... No, I'm sorry. I was at the um, Alliance to Defend Freedom, which was in a meeting in Phoenix. I was with Pat Mangan, and then we went to that, and then we went to the Heritage Foundation, and this is before Trump was going to beat... Um, uh, Cruz, but the issue was we were constantly looking what judges is the Heritage Foundation supporting? <laughs> They're the same ones the Alliance Defense is supporting. And we're going, it's all about are we going to pick the right judges? That's what the issue yeah. was. Yeah. So something new happened here. Now we're talking, I'm talking about the perspective of a 49 year, year long war about abortion that I entered early on and had been involved with this all along for certainly for the past 40 years, over 40 years now that I've been running this magazine. And that was that the Jews now, after the brief of Justice Alito got leaked, the Jews immediately came out of the woodwork. No one, no one, no one had associated Jews with abortion before. It was clear. I mean, nobody, had, it was women's rights and it was blah, blah, blah. Suddenly, uh, the threat of abortion coming to an end brings all these Jews out of the woodwork. And one Jew after another, across the board, across the country, is announcing that abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. I, we can run the, the, the picture. I'm going to put it on the cover. We've, I've already tweeted the picture. All over the country, there are Jews protesting, saying the same thing. Abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. And then they take it a step further and they say, if you ban abortion, you will prevent Jews from practicing their religion. The ADL said it. Every major Jewish organization said it. This is incredible. No one had ever said this before. Because I think they didn't understand the principle that they were operating. They panicked. I don't know why they panicked. The guilty flee when none pursueth. So they panicked and they said this. And I think they panicked because they understand that abortion is fundamental to the Jewish hegemony over our culture. And beyond that, what Roe versus Wade meant was the fact that the Jews had imposed their religion on the entire people of the United States of America. And we have been living under the Jewish religion for 49 years now. And we didn't know. And suddenly the Jews announced it. And they're all in agreement. So I'll say, I've been saying, you know, right around this time I started saying, Jew, Jew, abortion is the Jewish sacrament. I mean about the time of when, a couple of years ago? No, it's, it's fairly recently. Okay. I think I started to pick up the vibrations yeah. at the same time the Jews did. Abortion is Jewish sacrament. As soon as I say that, all these Jews come out and say exactly the same thing. They don't use the word sacrament. Obviously, sacrament's a Catholic word. They use religion. Jo Jews don't have sacraments, okay? But if they did, this would be one of them, along with sodomy. And but usury. the only logic that it is is to gain power. 
It's not because so, there's... So how do, they, how do they gain power? How do they do this? Well, what happened after Roe versus Wade is they completely abolished the notion of equality before the law. That completely disappeared. Because now you've got a whole class of human beings that have absolutely no rights. And I'm talking about the unborn, the fetus. So what happens now is that you have now a two-tier system in the United States of America. You fall into one of two categories. Either you're a fetus or you're the mother who's going to kill the fetus, in which case you have Jewish privilege if you abort, and you're above the law. The fetus has no rights whatsoever. You can take the fundamental right away, and that is the right to life. And if you take that away, you can take away anything. Well, this didn't happen overnight, but it began to percolate through the system until finally, uh, uh, what about Charlottesville? Remember Charlottesville? Well, they didn't know that the Constitution had been abrogated. They thought that there was still the right, First Amendment, right to free speech, right to assemble. Some of them felt Second Amendment, you had the right to bear arms. They didn't know that it didn't work, in, that it didn't work that way anymore. Because what they were, because they identified, if you identify yourself as a white supremacist or white anything, you are automatically a fetus. And you automatically have no rights whatsoever. And that means that the other side automatically has Jewish privilege. And the lady who had real Jewish privilege was a, a Jewish lady lawyer by the name of Roberta Kaplan. And she raised a lot of money to basically wage lawfare against those poor white boys who showed up thinking they had a right to assemble. In Charlottesville. In Charlottesville. <laughs> that was, no. And the, the next example, even more striking, is January 6th. Now, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag here, but there's someone in this room who went to January 6th. And I'm not going to say who it is. Yeah, I was at the Alliance for Defending Freedom, the Heritage Foundation. It was consistent. And, yeah. But now, I, well, you went to overthrow the government, didn't you? No, it was called, basically it was a prayer. A prayer meeting. That's what it was. We're going to pray and pray that uh, God's will be done. And that's what the majority, best majority, well, that's what I we saw, thought it that's was. What I'm, not, I'm not hearing this from the, the uh, congressional hearings. I'm not hearing this in the Washington Post. All I'm hearing is the word insurrection. Insurrection is the category of the mind that got imposed uh, on that event to destroy it. Well, there was traps, and I definitely was, I was expecting traps. I didn't know what, of what nature, but we knew it was going to be a trap of some kind. And so, for sure, not give the appearance that you're breaking any law whatsoever. Right. So they were lured into a trap. The FBI was involved. They're classic entrapment guys. And uh, these poor bastards got lured into something that was way over their heads because they didn't understand the fundamental change that had taken place under Jewish hegemony in our culture, which is basically if you, uh, uh, you think you have rights, you're basically a fetus. If you're a white boy, you're a fetus. If you're a Trump supporter, you're a fetus. And the other side has Jewish privilege, and they can turn this against you because they control the categories of the mind, otherwise known as the news media, the propaganda. So you're saying once they succeeded in, in saying that the fetus does not, then they have now they have a place to put everybody. Everyone, everyone, and just you, dump them there. That's right. And if you don't go along with the Jewish agenda, which means if you're not uh, a homosexual or a, a, a feminist or whatever these things, you're a fetus. Well, their word is goyim. Goyim and fetus are pretty much uh, related categories. They're kind of subhuman. Both of them, according to Jewish thinking, are kind of subhuman. And the fetus doesn't become a human being until it starts breathing. I, I don't want to get into halacha here, okay? Because, you know, if there are th three Jews, there are five different opinions, and you can, they can figure it out. All I'm saying is that every major Jewish organization came out at this time uh, with the leaking of Alito's brief and said abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. So, what is the fundamental principle of Jewish culture? The fundamental principle that unites 
the Holocaust narrative, the abortion hegemony over our culture, and the state of Israel is that truth is the opinion of the powerful. That is the rule now. Well, uh, the Talmud is an interpretation. And so they're making the interpretation, they're saying we've interpreted it to be this. And, and what's, the, what's driving their, their interpretation? It's to stay in power. I mean, what are you right. suggesting? What are you suggesting? I'm, is saying, <laughs> I'm saying that the, the, the Jews were heavily invested in abortion for various reasons, but the main reason was that they saw it as their cornerstone of their hegemony over American culture. The, the parallel is the pharmaceutical industry, this was Eustace Mullins, we listened to this 25 years ago, that the truth of the drug they picked, it was based totally on money. That's why they picked it. So it had nothing to do with good, good medicine. There's a game being played and we're right. being, we're being right. and deceived. So we're, yes, and so medicine was corrupted we have the big Jew Borla now, who uh, is the head of Pfizer, making money hand over fist by making people sick, destroying their immune system. And if you question that, you go, uh, you're going to be punished by being excluded from uh, the internet. This is precisely, we are at the, this is, let's put it this way, in historical context, it was the ADL's hate speech campaign. Okay, at this point, this is 2019. Uh, where people are starting to wake up to the fact that pornography is a form of control, at least partially because of the book I wrote, okay? And now the Jews are getting upset because they're losing control of the narrative. And so they go all out on this ADL hate speech campaign. And what is hate speech? What is anti-Semitism? It's any speech that the Jews don't like. And believe me, the one thing that Jews really don't like is any challenge to their political hegemony over your culture. As soon as you start talking that way, they get upset and they want to punish you. Nothing new. When uh, St. Uh, Stephen started to refute the arguments of the Jews, what did they do? Did they argue? No, they picked up stones. When the Jew gets upset, when he, when you say something they plug their ears. that the Jew can't refute, he can't he can't refute it. He doesn't say, okay, you win. You're right. I, I accept what you say. No, he picks up stones. They engage in violence. And that's exactly what they're doing. And I think that the, so the, the, the canary in the mine was the uh, hate speech campaign. Jews are losing control of the narrative. And then we got COVID as an attempt to bring it back, bring these, the Goyim back under control. And that's kind of worn off, and now we have Roe versus Wade, and they're really upset now because Roe versus Wade is uh, Jewish. It's the Jewish religion that it got imposed on us. Abortion is the Jewish sacrament that got imposed on us in 1973, and it looks as if that's going to go. Well, abortion is also like you're saying they don't want to hear the truth, so it's like throwing stones at Stephen. In other words, in a lot of cases, probably the majority of cases. People uh, have conceived a child out of wedlock, okay, Ill illegitimately. And instead of reasoning it through and repenting and addressing that, they go to violence. Like they went violently on Stephen. They go to violence and they kill that baby and they won't confront their right. own sin. Right. And this is not new with the Jews. And I've also claimed that, uh, wait a minute, this, we, I've heard this story before. It was in the Old Testament. The Jews were always falling away from the covenant that God made with them. Even after they, they, God delivered them out of the bondage of Egypt, how long did it take before they started worshiping the golden calf? Was it months? You suddenly forgot that he provided manna in the desert? So this group of Jews, this group of Hebrews, was always there. Uh, you can say, I think that even the, the, the Bible says, basically, it's only a remnant that's going to remain faithful. When I was reading the book of Sirach, it says there was only three kings that were, um, <clears throat> even in the King James, they have the book of Sirach, uh, only three kings that were not defective, David, Hezekiah, and Josias. 
The other ones were extremely sinful. That's quite a few. And what does sin mean? It means worshiping, fundamentally worshiping other gods. That's what false it meant. False gods. And how do you worship false gods? How do you worship that? By engaging in temple prostitution. And then when the temple prostitute gets pregnant, you offer that baby up to Moloch. So the, Jew, well, the group we call <laughs> Jews are Moloch worshipers. This is what this is. This is their. That's who your father. That's who their father is. This was the dispute that we, that uh, they had with Jesus. Well, the the, the typical falling away. If it, just like if you're, I mean, this, I use this. But if you're on the school bus, on a trip, you're in seventh or eighth grade, you know. And then what's the big scandal? What's the big corruption that's going on? You hear that some girl kissed a guy. Okay, and everybody's like, what's happening? Is the culture falling apart? Okay, we don't have those terms. But these things are significant because if, if it goes unchecked, where does it lead? Okay, and when a culture doesn't keep itself tight, like a lot of cultures do, like Japan does, like Korea does, right? They're only like 3% out of wedlock, or we're 40% out of wedlock. We have lost tight, tightness on our customs. You know? talking about, what we're talking about here is the growing Jewish control of our culture that was based on the moral corruption of the majority of the people of this country. <coughs> and the main vehicle for that was sexual liberation. And the Jews were completely behind sexual liberation from the beginning. The Jews were always involved with pornography. The Jews were involved in you when they took over Hollywood, they took over the film industry, they were always using films as a way of subverting the morals and ridiculing the faith of the majority uh, of the population here. They've never stopped doing that. Right. And it was, un you know, the big issue was, you know, you're going to hold a girl's hand, then you're going to kiss her, and then you all, oh, and then, you know, that, that would be it. Or, and then, but little by little, especially in the 65, 67, I mean, it just sped up. And before you know it, girls are getting pregnant which was unheard of right and this is what this is what happened during this period of time and it was all based on this those three you know the rise of israel the rise of the holocaust narrative and the rise of abortion also we have to bring in the obscenity uh, battle that was taking place at that time the production code the production code was always a hindrance the catholics had always uh, controlled Hollywood, uh, controlled it from 1933 up to 1965. And 65, they broke the code, the Jews did, with a Holocaust porn film called The Porn Broker. That's what broke the code. So these things are all related, and this is how they created hegemony over our culture. Now, this was a battle during this time in the Supreme Court. Well, what were the fault lines in the Supreme Court? 72, 73, it led up to... I'm saying for the entire 49-year period from 73 oh, to... Oh, okay. What were the fault lines? Was it white people versus black people? No, it was Catholics versus Jews with the Protestants in the middle. So this is, again, further substantiation of my theory that the real ethnic identity in America is religion as the basis for your ethnic identity according to the triple melting pot protestant catholic and jew what's the prime example right now samuel jackson the uh black actor just uh tweeted an attack on clarence thomas and the gist of the attack is that he's calling clarence thomas and uncle tom now you're in other words you're a traitor to your race well, wait a minute. That's not the issue here. Why did why did what what is what is uh, Clarence Thomas's identity? Is he black? Well, what's the black position on abortion? There is no black position on abortion. No, they're anywhere. They're anywhere <laughs> because there's no unity whatsoever. Because I'm saying fundamentally that race has no unifying characteristics whatsoever. Your color of your skin is not going to make you think one way or the other. So why does Thomas, what is Thomas? He's a Catholic. This is complete substantiation of what I've been saying about the triple melting pot, but also about the, the fault lines in the culture wars in America. It's Protestant, Catholic, Jew. And over this period of time, the Protestants just dropped out uh, because they're, they're kind of going out of existence. Certainly the mainline Protestants, 
Yeah, it's uh, shifted off powerful. into a <clears throat> non They have kind of disappeared. They have no significance whatsoever anymore. And it came down to a battle between Catholics and Jews. And suddenly, with the demise of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the, the, the lady who really believed that abortion was a Jewish sacrament, uh, the power base shifted with Donald Trump appointing people, and suddenly the Catholic idea, it's not all Catholics, but the, the Catholic ethos took predominance, and people like uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, the senior member on the court, was able to articulate the Catholic position in a compelling way, and the law of the Lord land changed. Yeah, now, because yeah, with Ginsburg going out, then Amy Coney Barrett just snuck right in. Right. Almost, and so yeah. uh, I'm saying the point here I'm trying to make is this is the beginning of the end of Jewish hegemony over American culture, and the Jews know it. The Jews can sense it, and that's why they're. But being, nobody is saying that directly, right? Nobody sees that. I mean, very few see that. They are saying it in a way that is unmistakable. Okay. By by saying suddenly out of the blue, no one had ever said this before in the 50 years of this abortion war that abortion is a fundamental Jewish value, and that if you ban abortion, you are preventing the Jews from practicing their religion. No one had ever said this before. Now, what they're really saying is that Roe versus Wade was the imposition of the Jewish religion on the entire people of the United States of America. And, That's what and they're the really Jewish, saying. And the Jewish uh, worldview, and the Jewish control. <clears throat> but that went That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <clears throat> That's exactly what that. First of all, if you get everyone to think like a Jew, then it's easier to control them because you control their thoughts. And that's precisely what happened over this period of time. Uh, the WASP ruling class simply evaporated over this period of time. So you can, the, I think the crucial year in this regard was 1978. Uh, which is the year that Nelson Rockefeller died and John D. Rockefeller died, who were the, the paladins, the, the great representatives of the WASP ruling class. And their great cause was, of course, uh, eugenics and uh, contraception. But when, when people like that died, there is a transition to There's a, new a transition. Era. <laughs> and, and that point, so at the beginning, if you go back to the period like right after World War II, the CIA, it's a WASP operation. It's basically guys from Yale and Harvard. Um, running the CIA, and you got Jews as the junior partners here. So you have Sidney Gottlieb, Jew who's running MK Ultra. MK Ultra is full of Jews, okay? But they're they're kind of the junior partners here. Over this period of time, they WASP went out of existence, and the Jew became the senior partner and took total control of our culture, total control. But is, isn't it <laughs> unrealistic from a logistics? in a strategic way of looking at things that you can expect that 3% of the population is going to absolutely get control? Aren't they afraid of the 97%? No, it's not unrealistic. <coughs> it's, it's implausible if you have representative government. If you have representative government, then how is 3% going to take over the population or 2% going to well, take they, over they, the population? They, they, they take over the definition of representative com government. Right. They, they and also, they buy off the politicians. So you have the rise of Jewish money. Casinos, good example of how Jews concentrate money, steal it from everyone else. That used to be illegal, but hey, no, we're going to have freedom now so that Dan Gilbert can uh, basically, and Shell Nadelson can name all the politicians. Well, I read 25 years ago, 60% of Democratic money came from Jewish donors, and 40% of Republican money came from Jewish so, donors. So what they, what they understood over this period of time is, sure, a minority can take over and rule the majority. That was the message of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. It was a Jewish political movement. Uh, not every Bolshevik was a Jew, but the movement was Jewish and could never have succeeded without Jewish leadership. But they have to and, use a type... And Jewish money, by the way. Jewish money uh, by, uh, from Jacob Schiff uh, giving money to Trotsky. It never could have succeeded without that, okay? So it was a Jewish, uh, so you don't need, I mean, proof, uh, Bolsheviks are proof that a small minority can take over a huge country, took over Russia, and ruled it for what, 70 years? But that was because of the total trauma of World War I. Where was our trauma? <clears throat> Civil War? I mean, the 60s trauma, or what? 
are you talking about, if you're talking about trauma meaning weakness, where, where, where was our Achilles heel? It was World War II. And that's, what, why do I mean World War II? Because World War II allowed the government to engage in the social engineering of virtually every male in this country. Either directly through induction into the army, you had 11 million soldiers. Even more, I thought I read 16 million. There was a lot. Whatever, <laughs> yeah. whatever. A lot of men are now subjected to the most ruthless form of social engineering, which is called military service. And they come back, and the, the, the net result is you start off with these guys. Uh, they're coming from farms in Tennessee. They're coming from ethnic neighborhoods in Chicago. And suddenly you have to have one single identity. So you erase their identity. It was World War II was massive identity theft, and right. they're, they're, they, they wear uniforms. It's not coincidence. It is called a uniform because it brings about uniformity. Well, what what's the significance of? I read about a Wisconsin professor who was doing a study of the sexual involvement of the soldiers in France. Look, and she said the American men were the worst. Right, raping the war. Most. War is always leads to the destruction of sexual morality. It's, it's never been a and war they bring that, that they bring that home, and they, the fathers did not grab their sons within the devotions or the, the playing the rosary and say, now son, number one, God says no sexual, immora you know, no sexual involvement to your marriage. It married. was a wound. It was a, clearly a wound. They were, set, they were morally wounded returning. Right, so you weren't grabbed, and I wasn't grabbed, which generations before, and the father would say, son, this is not about the birds and the bees directly, but there is no sex until you get married. Do you understand that? They were wounded. They were wounded, and the man who compounded the wound was Alfred Kinsey, who wrote his uh, book on the, uh, what is it called, Human Sexuality in the Male. The Male Sexuality book came out in 1947, where he's, first of all, he, he was a homosexual. He it was deliberately skewed in that direction, but it was skewed in the effect of, you're talking to people who most likely were had somehow participants in World War II, where the sexual morality was uh, challenged, certainly challenged. It totally broke. So one generation to another generation, that message is always passed on down, and all of a sudden that message isn't passed on down. That's right. So you, this is so you begin. This is the beginning of social engineering. It started with the GI generation, and they were softened up, uh, and they were uh, robbed of their ethnic identity. And suddenly the next generation comes along and they are severely weakened. And then when the CIA gets involved with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they're swept away because the parents don't know what to do. I mean, look, how can it be bad? I just, saw, I just read an article in Time about how these guys are, uh, and life, they're talking about LSD as some type of serious blah, blah, blah. They were already primed and they were swept, uh, the next generation was swept away by the ferocious social engineering and the main, one of the main vehicles was sex. And if you're having sex, chances are the woman's going to get pregnant. And if the woman gets pregnant, then you have to have abortion. Otherwise, the whole world, the whole world that they're trying to create will fall apart. And that's how, that was the prelude, and that's how the Jews took over our culture. That's how they did it. And, they, <clears throat> and that book, Ehrlich, World Population uh, Explosion or Bomb. Right, that was all, <coughs> that was all part of it. They, they had all these things contributing. Right, we were all going to starve to death by 1976, or India was going to starve to death by 1976. Uh, that was part of the propaganda barrage. And everyone, uh, the Catholics were completely uh, unprepared to deal with this. Unprepared. Well, they were sh Vatican II caused them to <clears throat> have to deal with all kinds of new things too, and this was another thing that they weren't prepared. So, with our, my thesis now, we can talk about this. This is the my review of the Peter Zewald's biography of uh, Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, I think that the conclusion we have to draw is that Ratzinger was instrumental in throwing out the Ottaviani preliminary documents that led up to Vatican II, uh, which condemned both America and the Soviet Union, and decided to do, we need to be positive. Now this is Ratzinger, who's 17 years old, 
at the end of the of the war. He's 20 years old during the hunger year. <coughs> he imposed the Holocaust narrative on the Catholic Church, and it came back to destroy him. That's what destroyed him when the Williamson affair broke him. He was accused of letting a Holocaust denier into the church. He didn't know what to say. Didn't know what to say, and he was swept away by it. Did the Germans? The Germans actually ended up believing the Holocaust narrative. It's you <laughs> got look. It's uh, if you don't believe in it, if you state publicly you don't believe, you go to jail. Now so this again is classic Jewish hegemony over your culture. So this is this is we're like, not going to argue. <laughs> we're not going to say it's like the, the abortion issue. It's exactly analogous to the abortion issue. You're going to come up with well, look at the ultrasound. There's a baby there. That ba look at the knife. The baby's recoiling from the knife. We're watching it with our own eyes. That's irrelevant. Truth is the opinion of the powerful. That's it. I don't care about any facts. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg stamps her foot, and that's the end of the discussion. And it, she, she, the only reason the discussion ended is because she died. But it's similar to what the Muslims do. The Muslims are going to say, you either submit or pay the tax, you know, they, they put this pressure and what happens? People end up submitting and histor history shows they submit, right? And when, you, when they, f they pull these tactics, what happens? Usually people submit. The Germans ended up submitting especially to, the, to that if, narrative. Especially if you don't understand what's going on, if they, if they make it sound plausible, and that's the whole point of the mass media, is to make murder sound plausible. Whether it's the murder of Palestinians, remember the, the uh, word just came out, that journalist, that Palestinian journalist, who happened to be an American citizen, was shot directly in the head by a well-aimed bullet. This is Jewish privilege. This goes back to the abortion thing, back to the Holocaust narrative, back to the uh, shift on Israel. The Jews can get away with murder. The classic example of Jews getting away with murder was Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision. The other classic example is Israel. This is the Jewish hegemony over our culture, and I'm saying it's over. This is the beginning of the end, and the Jews know it. Um, this is what they've always been afraid of, right? When, when well, they be guess afraid? what? Yeah, there's talk now in Israel. The longest that any Jewish kingdom has lasted was 77 years. I mean, like you're talking all the way back to King David? Or yeah, I'm talking about the, the, those Jewish kingdoms. Well, we're coming up on that, and the Jews are getting worried. I mean, the kingdom started with World War II? Or are you talking about I'm Israel? The founding of the State of Israel. Okay, Israel. <coughs> founding of the State of Israel. Well, that's the year I was born. I'm 74 years old. I guess you've got, what do you got, three more years? This is the way the Jews, the Israelis are talking this way. They have this idea haunting them that this may not go on forever. True, but we're tied at the hip with Israel, aren't we, as a nation? Or are we not? I am saying that once you pull out Roe versus Wade, it's the beginning of the end of Jewish hegemony over your culture. Maybe there's a supernatural element. Maybe the devil needs this type of human but, but on the surface, all it does is go back to the states. <clears throat> so, and, and so on the surface, it looks like, well, nothing's really changed. You may have to drive 100 more miles. Everything has changed. <clears throat> because the government is no longer giving its approval to murder. The federal government. I'm saying the government, the government that we live under. And the laws in states like Wisconsin are going to uh, automatically snap back to trigger, the status trigger, trigger back, they call it, the trigger yeah, laws, yeah. They're going to snap back to the status quo ante. But how about New York, California, which is going to allow abortion? You're going to have a divided country. And that's a, ah. an admission <clears throat> that the empire is over. The whole point of the empire is you have to unite the country to project power outward. Now we're going back to the original st original state of uh, the country, which was basically independent states who united together. Nobody claimed that the people in Massachusetts agreed with the people in Virginia. They did so not this agree. Is, this, is a, this is a breakup of Washington, D.C. power. That's right, because now you have to be living under the fiction. There's no difference between Massachusetts and Washington. There's no difference between Greenwich Village and Mississippi. Well, no, that illusion. Now there is a difference. Now it's over. That illusion is gone, and that is head, now we're heading in the opposite direction. And that is the cunning of reason, and that is how God works in human history. Good, good. Period. I think are we wrapped up here, okay.
uh, Citizens for Community Media here in South Bend. This is going to go on the local public access, and we'll put it up on the YouTube. Be on all of our YouTube outlets, or all of our media outlets. Yes, yes. Till next time. Nicodemus, come to visit Jesus. Right at night for fear of the Jews. But on that fateful day, Christ took all his tears away. Nicodemus may leave the good news. Peter swore that he'd be true to Jesus. Then denied him three times in the night. But on that Sunday morning,